On today's episode of the John Campy Show podcast, has Disney Plus really just been one big mistake for Disney? Has it hurt them more than it's helped them? Also, Fran Drescher, president of the Screen Actors Guild, has decided to go on an Italy vacation just hours before a SAG strike. That's kind of an interesting approach, I suppose. Mission Impossible. We saw it. We're going to review it. Also, a brand new trailer for Willy Wonka with Timothy Chalamet is out, and it's fantastic. That and a whole bunch more. The John Campus Show podcast starts right now. Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the best damn movie related show on the planet Earth, The John Campy Show. Coming to you from right here in our adorable little office here. Brought to you in part by our friends at Mint Mobile. I am, of course, your host, John Campy, and it is an awesome honor and privilege, as it is every day, to have you, our international friends, gather around as we talk about our favorite things in the world, movies, movie news, TV, and streaming, and all sorts of good things, not just giving you our opinions, but giving you information and context so you can form your own well-informed opinions, whether they're the same or completely different from ours. Uh, joining me in studio, as always, on this Tuesday, we got Ray Ora. Hey, hey. Jonathan Voiko's here. Hello. Chris Carr is here. Hey, guys. You look good for somebody about to go on strike. Oh, thanks. And, of course, most <laughs> importantly, you guys are here. Thank you so much for being here and making this show part of your day, and here's how today's show is going to go. We're going to start off by talking about those topics we already listed off. And then in the last part of the show, we're going to take questions from our YouTube channel members. Now, if you're listening to this podcast, we also have a YouTube channel. And on that channel, we have some wonderful supporters known as channel members. And thank you to all you guys who are channel members. And we ask them every day to send in some topics or questions for us to address on the show. So with all that down, let's get into it and start with this. You know, Disney Plus came out with a big bang. I mean, they launched with the Mandalorian, all that kind of stuff. They've had their ups and downs, you know, some big subscription explosions, some subscription declines and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, has it worked out for them? Well, that happens to be the topic of today's Mint Mobile hotline question of the day. If you guys have a question for either our podcast or one of our videos that we do on YouTube, go ahead and call it in anytime 24 seven at 951 268 4259. And once again, today's question is about has Disney Plus hurt or helped Disney? Check it out. Hey, John. Diego here from Chicago. I was watching your show today talking about how Max has now passed Disney Plus, and it got me wondering has Disney Plus caused more problems for Disney than anticipated? The day and date release strategy for Pixar has now caused long term problems for the studio. Marvel has seen a significant drop in quality by and large because they are stretched too thin adding these shows into their release strategy. Even more so to that point, the shows generally on Disney Plus are just not being that well received. Lastly, Iger initially said that it would be a couple of years before Disney Plus was profitable, but the overall landscape for Disney was significantly different back then than it is today. What would be the benefit of Disney getting out of the streaming wars? Do you ever see that happening? Thanks and bring on the filthy. All right. Thanks a lot, Diego, for calling that in. And you know what? It Not long ago, that would have seemed like a preposterous question. Like, is Disney Disney Plus a good thing? What are you talking about? Of course it's a good thing. And I'm not saying it's not. All right? I am not saying that Disney Plus is not a good thing for Disney. But you raise several significant, well-pointed out items here. Let's look at some of the repercussions of what Disney Plus has done. First of all, it's incredibly expensive. Running a big major streaming network like this is preposter preposterously cost prohibitive. It's insanely uh, expensive. Check this out. This was an article in uh, the LA Times. This was during the first quarter of this year. Wrote Disney's streaming business posted an operating loss of $650 million, not for the year, a loss of $659 million for the second quarter. That's one quarter compared with an $887 million loss in the same quarter last year. And Disney has promised investors that the service will be profitable by the end of fiscal year 2024. I do not believe they are going to be able to meet that promise. Uh, Disney's average revenue per user also improved after the company raised subscription prices. Domestic revenue per, 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 per subscriber increased to 20 per, from 20% to $7.14 a month. So this is an incredibly expensive thing. Now, that does not catch Disney by surprise, right? You mentioned Bob Iger said right at the outset that it was going to be years before Disney Plus would be profitable. 
Take a look at actually how long it took Netflix's streaming business to become profitable. It was many, many, many years before they just recently started to become profitable. It took a long time. Now, Disney's a little bit out ahead of the game. But you also pointed out a couple things. Number one, I believe that Disney Plus, not so much Disney Plus, but their philosophy with Disney Plus has really hurt a couple of their brands. First one you point out was Pixar. Their decision to take a number of Pixar films, some of them were brilliant, and dump them on Disney Plus undermined the public's perception of the company from being a prestigious theatrical motion picture studio to just being a made-for-TV cartoons. That's the image that they created for Pixar films by just taking a sequential number of them and just dumping them on Disney+. Plus. Films like Luca, films like Soul. God, don't even get me started on uh, the animated brilliance of Turning Red. That movie should have won Best Animated Film of the Year. I stand by that. But at any rate, they created this thing where they just dumped it on there, and now the perception about the event of a brand new Pixar film, it's kind of gone. You also pointed out the Marvel stuff, right? In launching Disney+, Plus, they believed that a key component of that was to take their most valuable asset, the MCU, and make that a key driver on Disney+. Plus. In theory, that's sound. That's a good idea. It's your most valuable thing. It's the thing that gets the most attention, the most pop. Make it a main driver of your streaming service. I get that. I do. However, it ended up costing them a lot not just in finances to do it, but in the fact that, number one, they kind of watered down the MCU a bunch by putting out a bunch of substandard, by substandard, I mean by MCU standards, they put out a bunch of substandard product. They took what was already an insanely busy schedule for the MCU and doubled it. Now you have people, let's say they were doing six projects a year, so you pick your six best storytellers. Well, now you're doing like 10 projects a year. That means you've got four or five storytellers that weren't good enough to work for you before, but now they work for you because you've got so much product you have to put out. It has watered them down. It has stretched them too thin. And listen, the same thing can be said about Star Wars. Has When Mandalorian came out and was the only thing out there, you could make the argument legitimately that Mandalorian was kind of healing the wounds of Star Wars. And you would have been right at the time. But by continuously cranking out the Star Wars product out there, it's had a mixed results. Yes, you had Mandalorian Season 1 and 2. Yes, you had the brilliance of Andor. But you also had the Book of Boba Fett. And you also had the third season of Mandalorian. And you also had Obi-Wan. And so it's had some positives, but also negatives that have gone with it. And so when you sit back and you look at all the money it's costing, because right now they're losing about $2.5 billion a year. Let me say it again. Right now, they're losing about $2.5 billion a year. Last year, they lost close to almost $4 billion. Hopefully, next year, they'll lose maybe only a billion, if they're lucky. I know they're saying they're going to be profitable by the end of fiscal year next year. That ain't, that, that's not going to happen. So the question is, is Disney Plus a mistake? Was it ultimately a mistake? Here's where I am right now on this. And listen, I reserve the right to change my mind about this as new information comes to, to light. But for now, my thought on it is this. Disney Plus is still a magnificent idea. For me, the main value of Disney Plus to me isn't even their new stuff. Like, hey, I'm going to stay up till midnight to watch the new episode of Secret Invasion. I've been liking Secret Invasion. But the main thing to me is I now have this depository in this one streaming service of all the Disney classics, of all the Pixar greats, of all the Star Wars movies whenever I want, of all the MCU stuff whenever I want. On top of that, a lot of other stuff that is there, available to me all the time. To me, that is my prime value of Disney+. Plus. And hey, if you can crank out a WandaVision and crank out an Andor from time to time, bonus. So I personally like it, and I believe there is value there. 
but they've had to reevaluate their idea about we're going to crank out 25 premium things every year and all that kind of stuff. Number one, because they haven't turned out to be all that premium. Number two, it's stretched them way too thin. And number three, it's been cost prohibitive. They've been losing money because of it. And we've seen in recent months that they've been scaling that back. And so they're recognizing that. So I believe a lot of this has to do, Chris, with growing pains. Mm -hmm. This is still, listen, this in terms of industry, the streaming industry still isn't even a baby. It's an infant still. And there's a lot they're going to have to figure out because the landscape of streaming looks a lot different today than it did two years ago. Absolutely. Everybody thought the world of streaming was going to be the rainbow that led to pots of gold everywhere you went. They are learning that's not the case, all that kind of stuff. So I still see value in Disney Plus and what it can involve, evolve into, but I do acknowledge that in some ways, it's been very damaging to the Disney brand as a whole. You look at this, you heard the question they were asking. How would you address this? Well, and I, I completely understand why people did think this was going to be the promised land. Because two, three years ago, this was the lifesaver for Disney. Right, as everybody the, thought that. Yeah, yeah, the parks were closed. Disney was hemorrhaging money. And having this, having this streaming service really helped them and helped people. When it comes to Disney+, Plus, you've got a tale of two consumers. You've got the actual customer and you've got investors. Mm. And things for customers aren't going particularly well when they are for investors. Right. And what I mean by that is you were bringing up the $659 million number there, right? So Disney Plus and its two services, this is from ESPN back in May, um, they trimmed losses by $228 million or 13% from that $659 million, right? So they are slowly and surely making progress as far as it's is concerned with actual loss. Will they turn a profit this year? Absolutely not. That's so ambitious. That yeah. is so optimistic of them. But this all falls in line with all of these cutbacks that Iger's making right now, right? Of less streaming content. And Iger talking about how they have to really look at what they're spending on new content. Yeah. That's been and one of the biggest the big problems. Thing. Yeah. These and we've seen that throughout the industry right now. These huge ballooned, ridiculously bloated budgets for things that don't make sense. They just don't, especially when so many things are being done on the volume or so many things are being yeah. done without practical effects. You know, it, it's something that nearly needs to be reined in. And at least Disney is making note of that. Now, as this is continuing to get better for investors, this is where I mean the, cons the customer isn't going to have as great of a time. Disney's really leaning into advertising and that's where it's going to get its money back right now is there's going to be so much more ad revenue placed on there. They're going to roll out sometime this year a new Disney Plus on, uh, in Europe that has a whole bunch of different ad tiers and everything. And so that's how they're planning on recouping costs. And that's become an industry thing, right? Yeah, because absolutely. it's not just, I mean, we Hulu's done that for a long time. Mm -hmm. Netflix is getting involved in that. Exactly. So we, that's becoming an industry thing. And we all were very, very fortunate with how Netflix was before when they were the yeah. only game in town because, yeah, I don't watch ads on that. That's great. And that's what I'm used to and I'm accustomed to. And once an ad comes in, how dare they do this to me? but we're going to be seeing that across streaming platforms disney is definitely going to be rolling that out a lot more we're going to see less streaming content as well too which ultimately though that's what i think will be good for customers because right now like you said they are stretched so, so thin there's so many different projects there's so many spinning plates and they haven't been quality so if there are instead maybe two or three streaming projects on disney plus each year for the mcu I'd be happy with that if those are really solid, great ones, because I can count on one hand how many things I've actually thoroughly enjoyed and that have stuck the landing and didn't disappoint me because there were eight episodes. Right. But there's a lot going on there with them. Yeah, because right now, they are unfortunately, when you see statistics like the one we point out, that, okay, yeah, they lost $650 million in this quarter. But last year in the same quarter, they lost $880 million. The improvement, though, and this is worrisome for Disney, is not come from new subscribers. That reduction in losses came from reducing their costs, cutting jobs, and getting rid of some content on Disney+. Plus. It seems to me like they are heading towards what I think they always should have been, which is the primary job of our streaming services is that this becomes the home of all the content you go and see in movie theaters. That's where this stuff then comes. That reduces the amount of money you got to spend. I completely agree with you. If they focused on, say, putting out two MCU things a year on Disney+, Plus, take the, the budget you would have had for four, reduce that a little bit, and then give like 1.5 the budget to just two shows, yeah. make them great, and just use your streaming service more as a depository, I think they 
could become profitable maybe by 2025, 2026, 2027. Yeah. I just don't see how they're going to cut another $2 billion in losses between now and then. Also, there's been a lot of talk that they may sell ESPN. And I never believed it before, but I'm starting to believe that they might. Oh, yeah. And then ultimately, the big step of combining Hulu into Disney Plus, I think, will be a big boon for them, too. Anyway, huge stuff going on there. I, I, I do believe there's an argument to be made that Disney Plus is ultimately hurt, but I think it's hurt them in the short term. It's still a product and an industry in evolution, and I think they can get it to where it needs to be, but changes need to be made. All right, guys. That down. <laughs> Let's talk about this. So what are we at? About 34 hours from a strike deadline? Yeah, the deadline's 11.59 p.m. Tomorrow night, or is it tomorrow tonight. night? It's tonight. Tonight. Really? I thought it was Wednesday. Wait, at... uh, oh, wait, no, you're correct, because it's on the 12th. Right, so we're about 30-something yeah. hours away from the strike deadline for the screen. First... I'm so glad I have tomorrow off, so I can just be filled with dread all day. Yeah, just sit home and worry about everything. <laughs> so, the which would be the first actor strike in 43 years. Mm -hmm. Since 1980, the actors have never gone on strike. They've been able to come to deals. They've been able to negotiate. They've been able to keep the industry going. Well, right now, and, and we made a video about this on our YouTube channel earlier. Uh, right now, the Screen Actors Guild's leader, their president, is uh, actress Fran Drescher, who I mentioned on YouTube earlier, will always be in my good books. Let me be clear about this. She will always be in my good books because she was in UHF with Weird Al Yankovic. And anybody, I don't care, who you are in that movie is good with me. Emo Phillips, forever in my good books. <laughs> Love that movie. But she is the president of the Screen Actors Guild and leading the negotiating committee. And in an absolutely indescribable move of stupidity, Fred Drescher, president of the union, head of the negotiating committee, literally in double-digit hours away from the union's first strike in 43 years, decided it was a good time to get on a plane and fly to Italy to go to a fashion show and hang out with Kim Kardashian. Uh, you can see, if you're watching the video version of this, uh, there's this, the headline from this picture here is SAG after President Fran Drescher criticized for tone deaf promotional trip to Italy on eve of possible strike. Now, I, I want to read this a bit. This is from Variety that wrote this SAG after President Fran Drescher has come in, has come under criticism at a tense moment in the union's contract talks with the major studios after she took a weekend trip. Remember, we're talking hours, double digit hours from a possible strike, she took a weekend trip to Italy to participate in a Dolce & Gabbana promotional event. sag after emphasized that Drescher was still engaged in negotiations. Oh, I'm glad she had her cell phone on her. That's nice. Uh, despite her, in, her international travel, a picture of Drescher posing with Kim Kardashian surfaced Monday on social media via Kardashian's Instagram account that sparked heated response from actors, writers, and other members of Hollywood's creative community who are on pins and needles this week as the Union and the Alliance of Motion Picture and Television Producers face a deadline of midnight Pacific time on July 12th to hammer out a new three-year contract barring a deal the Union is expected to begin its first industry-wide strike since 1980. Okay. SAG put out a statement that said, hey, it's all okay. We knew she's been associated with this brand for a long time. We knew she had this, she, we knew she had this fashion show appearance booked well in advance. We knew, we knew that was coming. We knew that was coming. Okay, and I, I get that. Now, Chris, I am not a member of the union. You are. Mm -hmm. And so tell me if I'm out of line when I say that that's fine if you are a member of the union. It's like, hey, I've got an engagement that I've got to go to. I know my union may be going on strike. My fellow actors and I may be going on strike. But, hey, I, I, I've got this engagement that I've had planned Terry for a Washington while. Washington was there. I need to go out and go to this thing. Yeah. That's fine if you are a member mm -hmm. of the union. But if you are the president of that union and supposedly leading the negotiating team, if I am a union member and you are my president... Maybe you sit out the fashion show. Like, if I'm a member of this union, and I am not, but if I was, 
I would want to know, as my livelihood is on the line, that my president was hunkered down in a war room, nonstop, no sleep, going over the contracts, going over proposals, doing everything she humanly possibly could to try, you may reach a deal, you may not, but to try to reach a deal before the deadline that's going to put me and 100,000 plus of my fellow members in a strike situation. Listen, we shouldn't be burning cities down over optics. I understand that. But when you are the president and head of the negotiating committee, the optics of you saying, yeah, I'm free. I'm going to hop on a plane and go to fucking Italy. But don't worry. <laughs> don't worry, though. I've Where'd got my phone on me. <laughs> Everything's fine, everybody. I got my phone so I can be reached if anything important. The optics Just... that you have your union members sitting at home wondering when they're going to even be able to work again. That's and crazy. they see you getting on a plane and flying to Italy to pose kissy face with Kim Kardashian, who got her career built off the fact that there was a writer strike a bunch of years ago. I, by the way, I'm, I'm not I'm not trying to disparage Kim Kardashian. I'm just saying. And we actually have footage of uh, Weird Al's reaction to all this. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> saying no for like, this is friend asking her friend weird out do you think i should go to italy like, and that's no. the face like, no go to spatula city that's go to, <laughs> go to spatula city spatula city you get to drink from the fire hose <laughs> I, I i you listen chris you are in the in the union mm -hmm. help me understand this how did you guys elect this person as your president and you remember i'm not trying to trash her <laughs> she's i'm she's gonna be in my good books forever but how did you guys vote this person in as your I president? I would like to once again remind everyone that I did not vote for her. <laughs> okay, I voted for Matthew enough. Modine. Uh, yeah, this is giving a lot of let them eat cake vibes. Yes, that's a perfect analogy. It's really actually. giving it that. It's giving I made my money when syndication made sense and residuals made sense. It's very unfortunate. And it is an optics thing, right? It's, it's an optics thing. And it's one where it looks terrible. Do better because you can absolutely have a personal life. I completely understand that. I'm a SAG member. We are on the cusp of a strike. I'm leaving the country in about a week or so. I had that trip planned for about a year. Um, I also know that when I take those trips, though, it means I have to tell my agent, hey, if work comes up, I either have to cancel my trip or we have to renegotiate or do things like that. You work things around. And she's a brand ambassador for Dolce & Gabbana. Being a brand ambassador means that you represent the brand in a good light. <laughs> is this a really good light right now? Actors are really bad at finding their light. I don't think this is a good one, Fran. So I don't understand why they wouldn't just skip this event. I feel like this is such a fair and reasonable request, too, with a brand that you have a pre-existing deal with, too. Hey, I'm in the middle of negotiations. I am so happy to do something here in L.A. for you guys. I'm so happy to do an additional photo shoot over here, or do something, but I have to be boots on the ground. And I don't know the inner minutia here and the inner workings of that, so maybe that's not how this goes. But boy, does this look so absolutely tone deaf. Because if you were talking about how you were in solidarity with a working actor, with working class actors, this is not it. This is not the move. And this just goes back to show so many of the things that she has done during her reign as president, whether it is, you know, these kinds of situations popping up for the negotiations, what she's done with COVID protocols, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, she just doesn't seem like she takes this job seriously. No, and that, that was going to be a question I asked because it's like, hey, listen, I get it. Look, if I had a standing engagement that I got to, as a brand ambassador, fly to Italy, hang out at this a seemingly this posh awesome black party. tie event and yeah. and mug on the carpet with Kim Kardashian. Of course, I'm going to go. But I got to ask the question. Do you take your job as president seriously? You can't just take the privileges of being president. You got to take the responsibilities of being president. If you don't want to give up these sorts of trips, don't be president of your union. Yeah. I, I, I just. Well, and it's it's not a glamorous job. It's not. And it shouldn't be. You're the head of a union. You are trying to make sure that unionized workers get their fair share. It is not red carpets. It is not Dolce & Gabbana with Kim Kardashian. It is a very different situation. And if that's not what you're in for, if you are only in it for the accolade of being president, then don't do it. 
Now, Plain listen, and simple. I should point out here, amidst all my bitching and complaining about this, that there are still 30 something hours left. Yes. There is a possibility that we find out tomorrow morning, ladies and gentlemen, a deal has been struck. A and a deal that the actors are happy with and it keeps the industry going. And hey, listen, if that happens, awesome. God bless. I don't think taking a day trip into Italy was helped matters much, but hey, maybe a deal still gets done. But I'm telling you what, maybe a deal was not going to get done no matter what happened. But if we get to midnight tomorrow and there's no deal, everybody is going to wonder if <coughs> maybe part of the reason no last minute deal could have been struck is because you got on a plane, took off to Italy for a while. Yep. I, I, I maybe and maybe that's completely unfair, but it's going to be a part it's of the be narrative. A conversation. It absolutely is. And even if a deal is struck, that whole letter, which Franny signed herself, a letter says, to herself, she says, signed. Hey, maybe leadership likes this deal, but if we don't, we are still prepared to strike. So there's a lot on the table here. And Fran really dropped the ball. So how does that work? Like, okay, so let's say she's like, okay, we made th we made this deal. We made concessions. Mm -hmm. Do all of SAG now have to be like, okay, that's not what we wanted, but you made the deal? Or or can you guys still strike even if she made a deal? So basically what will happen still have to then, ratify, right? Yeah, we can ratify things. So we would okay. take a vote on it, I see. All right, all right. Yeah, because that's what's happening too with the DGA, because certain directors as well, Scott Derrickson being one of them, was, hey, I don't know if I'm really going to go along with these new deals that we got. I'm thinking about not voting for this. Hmm. So that we still have the option of going against okay. it. Right. But, but just, just be clear. we got to get everyone to vote again. Yeah. The deal that the leadership of the DGA made did go to the members of, of the DGA who did vote to ratify yes. it. Yeah. And that's what would have to happen here. So theoretically, the SAG uh, negotiating team would have to come to a deal, and then they'd have to present that deal to the SAG membership who would then vote on ratifying the deal, correct? Yes. Okay, so... There you go, but oh my God, this is such a messy, messy, messy situation. Just, oh God. I just, I'm really glad for once that this show is no union affiliation. I'm okay. really happy about it. I feel, and I don't take it for granted, you guys. I am a very, very fortunate person to have an on-camera job that, that will still happen during this time that doesn't make me a scab. Which by so the way, yeah, I, I should address that actually because I've mm -hmm. had a number of people ask, write in and ask, hey, if because you are a member of the Screen Actors Guild, if the Screen Actors Guild goes on strike, can Chris still be on the show? The answer to that question is yes, because their contract is with the producers, uh, film and television mm -hmm. producers association, right? We are not a member of that. Yeah. So we are, we are not a union represented or union contracted uh, company here. We could be, mm -hmm. uh, but we are not. And therefore, yes, somebody who's a member of SAG can still come in and be yeah. on our show. And even if we were a unionized uh, show and everything too, we wouldn't be affiliated with those particular TV and film right. producers. Right, I am not a member of that. Exactly. I am not a signatory of the uh, so studio producers. Some of your other YouTube creators who you really enjoy who are SAG after actors or have SAG after contacts, uh, contracts, that is a new media contract. So it's a totally different animal. So you are helping support those people get their pensions and their health care, hopefully too. So definitely keep giving them extra views should we have a strike. Check us out first, though. All right. With that down, guys, we are still got to talk yeah, about Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning that Ray and I saw last night. We're going to talk about that new Willy Wonka trailer. We're going to take questions from our viewers. But before we do, we're going to take just a second here and thank two of the sponsors of today's episode of the John Campus Show podcast, our friends at Masterclass and Bird Dogs. We want to take a moment and thank the sponsor of this video, Masterclass. Guys, you know, as a small business owner, I am finding myself having to be in negotiations all the time, whether it's with new contractors, vendors, or even agencies that represent our company. Now, I don't like to go into these negotiations unarmed, so I found the perfect class on Masterclass, The Art of Negotiation by Chris Voss, a real-life former FBI lead hostage negotiator. Taking this class on Masterclass made me feel a lot more equipped and confident going into all these various negotiations I have to do on a regular basis. With Masterclass, you can learn from the best to become your best anytime, anywhere, and at your own pace. An annual membership starts at just $10 a month, and you get unlimited access to every instructor, thousands of online lessons, exclusive content, insight, and much more. There are over 180 classes to pick from, everything from filmmaking with Martin Scorsese all the way to cooking with the great Gordon Ramsay. In Masterclass, you will find practical lessons that you can apply to your life and work. So guys, get 
unlimited access to every class. And right now, as a John Campy Show listener, you can get 15% off when you go to masterclass.com slash campia. That's masterclass.com slash campia for 15% off an annual membership. Masterclass.com slash campia. We want to take a second and thank the sponsor of this video, Bird Dogs. You know, as a guy, there's only two things that are important to me when it comes to fashion. Looking good, and even more importantly, being comfortable. And that's where our sponsors, Bird Dogs, come to the rescue. Offering everything from pants like stretch khakis, joggers, and sweatpants, to shorts like gym shorts and swimsuits, and even great looking and comfortable polo shirts. Bird Dogs, like their stretch khaki shorts, are designed to fit slimmer through the thighs and legs, giving you a truly sculpted look. Bird Dog shorts fit way better than regular shorts that are made of a stiff, restricting cotton. You see, Bird Dogs fixed this issue by inventing cloud knit fabric that looks just like khaki, but stretches so you get a way slimmer fit without having to sacrifice movement. And that's just one of the reasons that by wearing Bird Dogs, you're gonna look good and more importantly, feel good. So guys, go to birddogs.com slash campia for a free Yeti style tumbler with your order. That's birddogs.com slash campia for a free Yeti style tumbler. Use code campia. You won't wanna take your Bird Dogs off. We promise you. <laughs> and thank you to our friends at Masterclass <laughs> and Bird Dogs for sponsoring this episode of the John Bird Campia dope. Show podcast. Yeah. All right, Ooh. guys. With that down, let's talk about this. Last night was the night. The night. It was the <laughs> night where the magic happened. And, you know, I'll stop your imaginations where they are right there. It was a uh, Mission Impossible night what? last night. Ray, me, and our buddy Ryan, we went out to watch Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning. Now, uh, the reviews came out, was holding like a 98%. Maybe you can double check that for me, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that because maybe it's holding a 98%, maybe it's not. But a 98% on Rotten Tomatoes. Is there an audience score there yet? Um, Nope. Not yet. Nope, not no. yet. Okay, so probably get that later today. Because the I believe today is the official opening day for it, 202 I think. Two reviews, too. Yeah, and at 98% still. So there was a lot of high hopes going into it. We've seen lots of features and stuff like that about the making of the film that all looked incredible and fantastic. We saw like a 15-minute scene from the movie at uh, CinemaCon with the big car chase through Rome. All that kind of stuff. But would the movie itself live up to it? Ray, you and I saw, we did a out of the theater reaction to it last night too. And uh, for those of you who may have not seen the out of the theater reaction, this movie is spectacular. It is absolutely spectacular. Now listen, I've got a lot of movies that I've loved this year. John Wick 4, Air has been like my second favorite movie of the year so far. Loved Creed 3, a bunch of great movies this year. Uh, Spider-Man Across Spider-Verse is still my favorite movie of the year. But I'll tell you what, after last night, Mission Impossible, Dead Reckoning Part 1 has become my second favorite movie of the year. Now, I, I forget, T Top Gun did get nominated at the Oscars yes. last year, right, for Best Picture? Mm -hmm. I think that might be two years in a row that Tom Cruise is going to have a movie nominated for Best Picture. I think there's With a very good one? chance. Yeah. Damn. I think this could get okay, a Best Tom. Picture nomination. I really, really do. Because mm -hmm. you're looking at, if we take, what have we had so far? I think Spider-Man Across Spider-Verse is going to be, remember, they're going to have 10 spots, right? Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse is the only one right now I'd say is a shoehorn lock for a Best Picture nomination. So let's say, let's say Mission Impossible, right? Well, what are the other contenders we got coming? We got Killers of the Flower Moon coming. We got Oppenheimer coming. We've got um, uh, Napoleon coming, the new Ridley Scott film, Napoleon. Th that still leaves us, and I'm sure I'm missing a couple, but that still leaves us five spots. Yeah, for mutant mayhem. I mean, mutant I'm not mayhem. sure. Mutant, I'm not. Maybe the number eleven spot. Maybe in the number eleven spot for Teenage Air. Mutant Ninja Turtles. I, I would think Air. Air might be a in the in the conversation. I hope so. I mean, as of right now, Air is my third favorite film of the year. I I love that. So I I hope it. Even then, yet still had five spots left. I'm telling you, this movie. There's there's a couple of plot issues that I can't go into here. I see him. <laughs> obviously. But, but I, I will talk about it when I do an open spoiler discussion probably later this, this Sunday. But this movie grabs you by the throat right away. First of all, it starts with, I won't say give details, I can't decide if the opening of this movie is a Hunt for Red October ripoff or a Hunt for Red October homage. One of the two, but whatever. It starts off, you're completely engaged. Immediately then the action sequences in the movie just keep getting bigger and bigger 
and bigger and bigger. And listen, we've all seen the motorcycle stunt. We've all seen a million times the footage of Tom Cruise doing the big motorcycle stunt of him going off the cliff. But when you actually see it in context of the movie, it's way more impressive. It comes across beautifully. And you've heard a lot of the critics talking about the final action sequence of the movie. I had no idea what we were in for. <laughs> the people in the theater, you could hear people in the theater as the action sequence was progressing at the end of the film. You could hear people audibly in the theater. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. <laughs> like all over the place. It's incredible. And it does a fantastic job of truly ending the movie while truly being completely a chapter one. You know what I mean? Where the, where this, yes, the, we got to have chapter two now to this, but they do a great job of that Tom Cruise is fantastic in it. Simon Pegg is great in it. Haley Atwell's fantastic in it. Rebecca Ferguson is fantastic in it. Ving Rhames. I, we, why don't we see Ving Rhames anymore? The Ving Rhames on screen is fantastic. I, I don't know the name of the actor who plays that sexy as hell bad guy. Oh my God, see. man. Gabriel. That's the worst part of the movie. Gabriel. Gabriel. He's great. Too, too clean. Oh, I think he's great. He's nah. so good. Too clean. Too clean. He's too, too clean for crew. He's a, he's a good looking man. He belongs on a freaking uh, Dos Equis commercial. Or like a <laughs> the, old, old I'm Spice. the most interesting I man thought, in the world. I, I saw Old Spice every time he came on the screen. Old Spice and uh, Sensodyne. 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 Because he's pearly white. I'm telling you, that, you that, is Morales? A, that is a handsome. Listen, you see this picture? It is not often you could put up a picture of Palm Clementine and say she's not the prettiest one in the picture. What? But she is not the prettiest. You are on your own island in that. In that, the, I, my eyes were on Palm the whole well, movie. Well, of course. By the way, Palm I was looking Clementine, for her every time she wasn't on on the scene. In the scene, she's better in on this in, movie than I than I. I like her more in this movie than I like her as uh, Mantis. Oh, I like wow. her more as a villain. She's great. She, she's got that like, oh, she's gonna stab you in the back. And every time you saw her, you were scared as hell. Yep. Like she instantly comes across as there. It was like. Terminator. A little bit of serial killer and Terminator. a little bit of a little Terminator, a little Harley Quinn, mm -hmm. kind of, kind of. So mixed. that's your type, Ray? No, I just, <laughs> just as long as they don't wear trench coats. <laughs> no that's trench fine. coats, but maybe we'll murder Ray. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I like, I, I'm a latecomer to Tom Cruise ever since Top Gun Maverick. I know you guys mentioned a lot of the outside things, though. Those don't really matter to me. And, what and he brings, I don't think they do the what, most what, average what he brings to the screen is all I, is all I care about. And this guy works hard. I uh, like oh, this, no this movie. Uh, he works hard, and I appreciate it. I appreciate it so much. Like this movie had a bunch of check boxes that I didn't think it would cover, but it did all in one thing: action, suspense. Even had Ninja tension. Turtles. You know, there's <laughs> even a little bit. There's a little bit of like uh, and when drama. And Donatello comes in at the end to help yeah. him out. Unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> Tom Cruise, can I get some of that cake too, please? please also, please, that please. Christmas cake that he but, sent but, us last year. But this movie did it for me. Like it was, it was great for as long as it was. I was there because he just kept it going. It just kept going and going and going and going. And I'll and tell going. you what, I, I was talking to a buddy of mine in the car ride to the office this morning. And listen, and no one's going to like this. I'm not the biggest fan in the world of the Mission Impossible series. I mean, I've certainly, like the last couple of ones, like Fallout, have been really good and I've really enjoyed. But overall, like from one through six, I like the Mission Impossible movies, a couple of them very, very much, a couple of them not so much at all. So I'm, I'm like, yeah, I like the Mission Impossible series, but I'm not the hugest, biggest fan of this. I love this movie. This was my first one, too. Oh. And I love the characters. I love his team. I love that, like, everyone has a specific job. I don't know if that's the way it is that's throughout the, the whole series. That's been the way through the beginning. Like, that's his yeah. team? Like, yeah. he has an actual team. Like, okay, that's 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 really cool. And the tech in this movie is great. And listen, there are twists. There are surprises. There are like everything, every time I thought, well, okay, well, this isn't going to surprise me. And then they did something that surprised me. The thrills are there. Makes you love movies. The, uh, it, it, listen, this is, this is movie magic. You know, the magic of movies is in that theater. And being in that theater last night, first of all, the movie started with Christopher McQuarrie and Tom Cruise coming on screen and saying, hey, guys, thank you for coming to see this movie the way it's meant to be seen. That's what they did for movie. Top Gun. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they did the same thing for Top Guns. Like, our movies, we make them to be seen as experiential events in theaters with other people. And I'll tell you what, being in that theater last night, it was a good theater. We were in a good theater last night. Mm -hmm. And feeding off as a viewer, 
feeding off the energy of all the other people in, th in that theater that were ooing and awing and cheering and gaspings and saying, oh my God, like right along. Like, That's did you hear about the guy sitting beside uh, Ryan? Did yeah, Ryan yeah, tell yeah, 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 he was like, <laughs> but no, I, I, I think we also got that bonus thing before it, right? Like the little red carpets uh, thing. They're not going to play that for. No, no, that was because last night was a special. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so we got screening. to see that. And I, I love when uh, they take the time out to do that, to thank like the audience for actually coming yeah, to the it, theater it, and see it. Guys, um, this is one of the best films of the year. Yes, it is. It's, it is so fun, so from a technical point of view, so beautifully made and constructed and put together. It's a timely uh, movie. Like the themes that they're addressing are questions that are being asked today. It, but it's just, woo! I, it's, my, it's my favorite Mission Impossible film of all time. Except it's the my villain. personal favorite Mission Except Impossible film. Except the villain, John. I love the villain. The Gabriel is villain. an Come awesome on. screen villain. Ugh. All right. With that down, guys, you, the reason we're not asking Chris... Uh, is because uh, we don't care. No, yeah, we, <laughs> Chris hasn't had a chance to see it yet. I haven't gone to see it yet. Okay, that's why we haven't. That's yeah. why we haven't gone over to Chris buttons. on this. You have kids though, so I just assume like you just saw like I don't know Rango. It's like I season seen sorry, Joe. Rango. <laughs> I just got around to seeing Rango. It's one of my favorite in season sorry bits. Uh, <laughs> what is the Kraken movie? Uh, oh, Ruby teenage, Gilman. Yeah, Ruby don't, Gilman, Teenage Kraken. Kraken Barrel. You kind of nailed that. <laughs> No, I've seen it, but I came in and they were like, we've never seen Ringo Ringo before, whatever it was. The, the lizard one, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. You're not far off. Oh, sweet. The okay. fortune teller right there. <laughs> All right. Let's get on and talk about this, shall we? Um, a new trailer today. We, we talked a little bit earlier on the YouTube channel. If you want to go check it out, we talked about the new Ahsoka trailer that dropped uh, today, which I thought was spectacular. But another new trailer dropped today for Willy Wonka, the one with Timothy Chalamet and being directed by, what's King's first name, Paul King? Paul King. Being directed by Paul King, the guy who directed the two masterpieces, and I don't even mean that facetiously, Paddington and Paddington 2. They're perfect. They are perfect movies. The best thing, oh, look at Ray's right there. Um, the best oh, thing. Yeah. going to fall over. <laughs> the very best thing about Nicolas Cage's The Unbearable Weight of Massive Talent was the profession that Paddington 2 is one of the greatest films of all time. That That's a big theme that runs throughout that movie. But Paul King directing this, and a lot of people, when they announced that they're doing another Willy Wonka movie, kind of gave the little side smirk. You know what I mean? They, they give him, why are you doing another Willy Wonka movie? I get that. Little wonky. I, I, I kind of would have felt that a bit too, except... I do believe, to, I believe that Timothy Chalamet, he's not yet, but I believe if there's anybody in the world who's going to be the next Daniel Day-Lewis, I believe it's going to be this kid. Uh, I have been never, like, even his really bad film, Bones and All, his performance is, like, scary. It's like, it, it's scary that this guy is still this young and is this good and he's just getting better. Like, his performance in it was incredible. So I love the fact that they got him as Willy Wonka. And then, of course... Paul King directing it, the director of Paddington and Paddington 2. Well, they just put out a trailer that they did show us at CinemaCon a couple of months ago. And the trailer is wonderful. It, it just, you want to feel that magic. You want to feel that whimsy and you want to feel that wonder, right? And as I'm watching, there's this great little part of the trailer where he's him and this little girl who's kind of like his partner in crime. He's like, I need an idea. And all of a sudden the light bulb goes off about him and just the way his head goes and talks. I, it was f so charming. By the way, Rowan Atkinson dressed as a priest running out of room yelling, run away, run away, which big tip of the hat, obviously to Monty Python, um, <laughs> was, is just life and air and breath. Hugh Grant <laughs> as an Oompa Loompa. It's freaking inspired. We had no idea at CinemaCon that Hugh Grant was even in this movie. And there's a little bit of a Hueissance going on, actually. Hugh Grant has been bloody brilliant in a couple of things recently. But when they brought up on screen Hugh Grant as an Oompa Loompa, the entire convention lost their minds. It was, it was one of the best things I've ever seen. <laughs> um, and there's a line in it, too, that I was saying off screen, off camera, before we started the show. There's a quote in the trailer that I don't have any tats, but if I did... <laughs> This is something I would possibly tattoo, possibly tastefully on my lower back. Like a tramp stamp. Yes. yes. Like in old English. In old English. With tribal. 
things it around said, surrounding yeah. it. But the quote was this. Every good thing in the world started with a dream. I love that line. You're going to love jail. <laughs> 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 you get that tattoo on your oh back God. and you go get arrested boy you gonna be most popular boy in jail come on we all say most the popular same. kid in we class the same Ray. <laughs> one thing in life i've Ain't learned no trying to read that <laughs> there's one thing in life i've learned we all we all the same <laughs> put that on your facebook bio man Every a tattoo in the world read that you're ready <laughs> You're already best friends now. <laughs> Before he really, I'll Time. show you. I'll show you a dream. Time ball. for a lullaby. <laughs> Time for another dream. Oh yeah, I that, dream that, that, the dream of. Quote, no, um, oh, that's really good. It's nice. Oh my nice god. Quote. But <laughs> no, it's placement nice. of that tattoo is sus. Just don't find yourself in prison. Every good in thing in the world prison? starts with me. Look, look. It starts with I think, I think there have been a lot of people that have been very skeptical of this movie, and I get it. And I think uh, there's going to be a lot of people that this trailer won't change their mind. That's fine. I thought the trailer was great. I really did. And it, is, it has really increased my enthusiasm for the movie. I have one criticism of the trailer. The, the, did he sound too... Uh, I can't believe I'm saying this because um, he kind of comes off as really carefully. young, right? Like yeah. really, really young. Well, he's young. supposed to be Maybe young. Maybe too well, young. he's supposed to be young. I mean... Yeah. But does he come across as just, just a baby? I think it's yeah. like he's like a kind of a genius, though. So he's more yeah, like he's a a savant, advanced. I mean, yeah. right? Yeah. That's, that's kind of what they're trying to I, paint a picture of. I got to get away from uh, comparing this to G the Gene Wilder, the one that I knew. that The one yeah, that I he know. was older at that And that's point. where I think yeah. I'm having conflicts right now. So as soon as I forget about that and just take it for what it is, I'm pretty sure I'll see. No, cool. I was with you on that, though, right? Because I'm one of the people who was very skeptical of this. Two years ago, when we saw the first look at CinemaCon, I remember you and Aaron Cummings lost your minds over that little snippet and went, it's fine. I don't know. <laughs> And he well, might what did be... you think about the, the new trailer? Though? Now I'm really into it because before it was he might be the next Daniel Day-Lewis, but is he the next Gene Wilder? And the answer mm. for the longest time was no. And I love Gene Wilder. I adore him so much. I think one of the greatest actors of all time, one of the best comedians. And this has so many hints of Wonka in it. There's so many lovely little ticks and moments that he just nails. And at CinemaCon, Timothy Chalamet brought this up too, of being the very wholesome, altruistic version of Wonka that yes. wanted to create. Yeah. And then eventually before by before he got yeah, jaded. You know, capitalism, baby. It'll change you. It'll change you. And this looks charming as I'll get out. Like I know, I know I'm gonna see this movie and be an absolute sucker for it. This is totally up my alley. It's all whimsical, it's got snow and dance numbers and chocolate and a stacked cast like nobody's business. Yeah, the cast I'm, is incredible. I'm really here for this now. Uh, uh, they gotta make the candy look good because that Ooh, first yeah. Willy Wonka with Gene Wilder, when he was in that uh candy shop. And they, he would give him a piece of chocolate and he would just, I didn't care what kind of chocolate that was. I was like, I want some chocolate. Plastic. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, I was going to make me hungry for some chocolate. Gloop. I would have jumped in that river and <laughs> yep. been like, I can die here. This is a great way to drown. <laughs> there were three films going into CinemaCon that I was either not really interested in or, or at the very best lukewarm on that completely won me over at CinemaCon. One of them was Wonka. This is one of them. The other two were Barbie. I was completely lukewarm on Barbie before the CinemaCon presentation. And the other one that I just have never cared about at all was, why am I even freezing on the name of it now? The Wizard of Oz one. Oh. Wizard of Oz. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The yeah. Oh, oh, the Wicked. Great Power. Wicked. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did not care one drip of urine about Wicked at all. And then they it's showed us nonsense. that presentation of Wicked, and I'm like, fuck me, I want to see Wicked. I want to guess it. You're, you're and they haven't released what so they good. showed us at CinemaCon to the public yet. But believe me, guys, you might be in the same boat as me that you couldn't have cared less about Wicked. When you see this thing that they put out, that they showed us at CinemaCon, whenever they do put that out, you will be looking forward to watching Wicked. This <laughs> so thing looks incredible. Uh, no excitement for the creator yet, though, right? I don't. What about you, you guys? I don't. I, I am excited about it. I, I like those kinds of stories, though. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Jonathan, you've seen the trailer for Creator? No. Yeah. By the way, sticking on uh, Willy I'm still, Wonka, though, I'm only on point right out, now, Timothy so. Chalamet, take a guess. How old is he, do you think? Uh, 14. 28. Uh, a solid 14. 28. <laughs> Ray 20. is much closer than, uh, than Jonathan. I would say 27. Uh, Jonathan just got it. 27 okay. years old. 
So, so I, I mean, I refer to him as a kid. I really shouldn't refer to he him as a kid. kid. <laughs> By the way, he's also got one of the greatest television commercials when he's talking to Jason Momoa about, yeah, who doesn't have an Apple oh, TV yeah, question? Yeah, yeah, yeah who, who, who doesn't? He's yeah. this generation. He's going to be this generation's Gene Wilder. And uh, he's got this generation's 27 year old. He had a big presence at CinemaCon, by the way, because not only was he there to come out on stage to promote Wonka, he was also there on stage with Zendaya. By the way, how good did she look? He was so funny, too. He was Uh, so funny. Come out to talk about Dune, too. Yeah, he's hilarious, actually. He was really funny. All right, guys, with that down, we are now going to move over and take questions from our YouTube channel members. But before we do, we're going to take just another moment and thank another sponsor of today's episode and our podcast, my mobile service provider, and they should be yours, the great folks over at Mint Mobile. We want to thank a sponsor of this video, Mint Mobile. From the gas pump to the grocery store, your utility bills and favorite streaming services, inflation is everywhere. Seriously, make it stop. Thankfully, there's one company out there that's giving you a much needed break. It's Mint Mobile. As the first company to sell premium wireless service online only, Mint Mobile lets you order from home and save a ton with phone plans starting at just $15 a month. You guys know that ever since I switched to Mint Mobile, I've been saving almost 70% a month over my old phone plan. For people Looking for extra savings this year? Mint Mobile offers premium wireless for just $15 a month. By going online only and eliminating the traditional cost of retail, Mint Mobile passes the significant savings on to you. All of their plans come with unlimited talk and text plus high-speed data delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. Use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan and keep your same phone number along with all your existing contacts. Switch to Mint Mobile and get premium wireless service starting at just $15 a month. To get your new wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month and get the plan shipped to your door for free, go to mintmobile.com slash campia. That's mintmobile.com slash campia. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash campia. And thank you to our friends at Mint Mobile. Chris is ready to check out for sponsoring this episode of the John Campia Show. You said you like these non-union jobs. (laughs) No union affiliation. It's different. It's different. (laughs) All right, guys. With all that down, let's get over and hear from our channel members. Chris, what do we got up first? From Jacob Hirsch. Saw some speculation that the 20th century Fox scene happens at the end of time from Loki. Thoughts on that as a possibility? Uh, I don't know. I I don't believe that. I don't think Hugh Hugh Jackman is not going to be introduced on screen in in a Disney Plus show. And Hugh Jackman was clearly in that scene. So I, I don't. I mean, listen, I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm just saying I don't buy that. I, I actually think that the, the pictures we saw today were are from the end of the movie, to be honest. End of the no, movie, he's but not... About Loki, oh, not Deadpool. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, what's next? From Ulatan. Oh, sorry, we have that. Oh, okay. another Jacob Hirsch. Over under 35%, Jennifer Lawrence appears in Deadpool 3 as Mystique. I'm going to go under 35. I wouldn't say below 5%, but the main reason is this, is that... Jennifer Lawrence isn't really associated with the yeah. original. Even though she was in those movies, she's not really associated a lot with that. Plus, she's notoriously did not really enjoy her time making those movies. So I think it would be a really difficult... So I'll, I won't go under 5%, but I will go well under 35. All right, what's next? Now from Ulatan. This uh, might be recency bias, but that Ahsoka trailer is the most exciting Star Wars trailer I've ever seen. Oh. I said this earlier today, and I will stick by it. I believe it is the best trailer for a Disney plus Star Wars thing I've seen yet. I mean, it had echoes of Rogue One, like that kind of flavor. Yeah, Mm -hmm. Uh, I I think it had everything. Now, Obi-Wan had great trailers. Book of Boba Fett had great trailers. I didn't like those shows. So I don't know if I'm going to like Ahsoka, but I thought the trailer was fantastic. I absolutely loved it. And seeing Ray Stevenson in in there as Balin. I think it's Balin. I think that was the character's name. That's the bad guy. Oh, so good. And mm, this makes me miss him even more. All right. What's next? All right. From the movie Maven 67. Hey, John and crew. What did you think of the fight Saturday? Volk cemented his status as an all-time great, even though I thought Year was going to win. And Pandoha upset Moreno. Called yep. it. Did you watch the fight Soiree? And oh. did I butcher all those names? It no, was a magnificent card. Like top to bottom. Uh, the, the hooker fight was unbelievable fighting hookers um dan hooker okay dan thank hooker. you just gonna yeah, say what did you watch yeah. new at ufc they grab it they whoa. are in vegas whoa prosticon oh as gosh. ray likes to call it put two prost no uh that's not what happened no the dan hooker fight 
Um, uh, look, I knew Volkanovsky was going to... Look, Volkanovsky is the definitive number one pound-for-pound fighter in the world right now. Uh, I mean, and you put him in... back. You take that Makachev fight, you give him 30 more seconds, he knocks out Makachev. I mean, that... I actually thought Volk won the fight, to be honest. But w- whatever. Uh, I think he's the best pound-for-pound fighter in the world. The whole card was absolutely thrilling, exciting, absolutely fantastic. Best one in a long, long time. All right, what's next? From Nightmare MF, Dear John and Crew, Deadpool 3 looks phenomenal, but with all the included cameos and guest appearances, do you think it could be over-convoluted, a.k.a. a clusterfuck? Not to mention the writer's strike. I hope I'm wrong. Love the show. Script was finished, um, so the script was done. So I'm not terribly worried about the script. As far as the number of characters in it, I'm not really worried about it. I mean, honestly, go back to the first Brian Singer X-Men movie. How many characters were in that movie? Well, there's a lot. Or X-Men 2 or or Avengers uh, Infinity War or Avengers Endgame. How many characters were there? Tons. The question is, do you have a storyteller that knows how to balance things out properly? It's like, yeah, we've got all these characters we need to use at certain points, but make sure we don't spend unnecessary time on them. Make sure each one, if they're going to be in there, they're playing an actual purpose and an actual role. It's not a problem. I never worry about how many characters are in a movie because we've seen lots of movies with tons of characters that work perfectly fine. So I'm not worried about that. So I'm not willing to say Deadpool 3 looks phenomenal because I haven't seen anything except for a couple of stills. Uh, so I now look, you know how excited I am for Deadpool 3, but I am not ready to say I think it looks phenomenal. Sorry, buddy. Uh, I'm not <laughs> ready to say it looks phenomenal until I actually see something from it. And then, but do I believe it'll be phenomenal? Yes, I do. All right, what's next? From Kayak, hey guys, saw Mission Impossible 7 last Saturday and it was great. It has outstanding set pieces, a threat that is more relevant today than ever before, and Haley Atwell is just mesmerizing in it. I think it's now my second favorite Mission movie, only behind Fallout. May rewatch the latter just to be sure. Yeah, I, I've talked to a couple of people I know that still prefer Fallout, and hey, you're not going to get an argument out of me because Fallout's fantastic. But for me, I think this edges out Fallout. I, I think this movie is just amazing. Listen, they establish that the stakes are very high, not just for the world, but for the individual characters as well. There's puzzles and mysteries and and surprises and all that kind of stuff. You're right, Haley Atwell is. I didn't know that she would fit into the Mission Impossible world. To be honest, I love Haley Atwell. I just don't know if she would fit in the mission. She does. Mm-hmm. Um, she's great in it. All right, what's next? From a min, percent chance we see Cannon pop up. Cannon. Cannon pop up in a short cameo as a flashback Force Ghost in Ahsoka. And if so, would they cast Freddie Prince Jr. or not? I think they would cast Freddie Prince Jr. I'm not convinced that Freddie would do it. Um, I. Sorry, I'm wrestling for a second about what's appropriate that I can say and what's what I can't. Private conversations and all. Uh, I'll just say this. I, I don't think there's a good chance that Kanan will be in it. I think, and I think if they did decide to have Kanan in it, I think it would be another actor. But again, obviously, if you watch Rebels, Kanan died. I mean, so Kanan's not going to be a character in this movie. Maybe some hollow or a flashback or something, but I, I don't think they're going to go there. To I think they're focusing on Ezra, honestly. What's that? They're focusing on Ezra. You know? Yeah, yeah. And listen, I would love if Freddie Prince Jr. popped up in a hollow or as, in a, as a flashback. I would love that. I really, really would. I just don't know that they will do that. All right, what's next? From Spencer's mother. I think the Deadpool <laughs> scene was taking place in the dimension that the TVA prunes everything to. The TVA is pruning the Fox universe. I mean, could be. You remember the end of Loki when Loki got went off into that place where he had President Loki there and everything? Maybe it's that universe. I don't think it is. I had a theory. And you weren't here when I said the theory, but I want to know what you think. Okay. I am forming a theory that admittedly has many, many holes in it. And probably not the case at all, but I'm going to go with it for now. I'm formulating an idea about what this movie is going to be about. Okay. Here's my theory of what Deadpool 3 is going to be about. There is a variant Deadpool who has decided, because you know the storyline, the uh, Deadpool kills the Marvel Universe? Yeah. So here's my thought. This variant Deadpool is angry and bitter that he was prevented from going to the Marvel Cinematic Universe 
because of the success of the Fox X-Men and therefore is off to kill all the members of the X universe. Because remember, we've heard Ian McKellen may be in there, that uh, Patrick Stewart's going to be there. We already know Halle Berry is going to be in there. Uh, we've heard, uh, who's the guy in the jury? Uh, 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 who plays James Cyclops? Marsden. James, we've heard rumors that James Marsden may be in there. Fam K. Jansen may be in there. So that, that Deadpool, in trying to decide that those X-Men existing, what prevented him from going to the Marvel Cinematic Universe is going to go back and kill all those members. So our Deadpool that is going to the Marvel Cinematic Universe and Hugh Jackman's Wolverine team up to try to stop this variant Deadpool. That's my theory. All right. Look, there's some YouTube channels that would run with that. Yeah. And be like, listen, guys, <laughs> this is what is it about. Yeah, I mean, it. I mean, and seeing them fight in the rubble of the 20th Century Fox logo is beautiful to me. Honestly, I feel like that holds water because of the uh, Jennifer Garner of it all now, too. Oh, yeah? Because we're getting rid of all the Fox folks. Yeah, so he could be going after Jennifer Garner, mm -hmm. which then maybe does Ben Affleck show up as Daredevil? I hope Ben Affleck just shows up as himself. Like he oh. shows up in a Dunkin' Donuts commercial <laughs> oh inside God. the movie. And it's just Ryan being like, Ben, why? Why yeah. are we doing this? Now, listen, I've had people say to me, you don't know, John, Ben won't be in there because, you know, him and Jennifer Garner are divorced. No. Yeah, but they get along really well. Yeah. They're, they're always speaking very, very highly of each other. They co-parent very successfully. So I wouldn't be surprised at all to see them pop up in this movie together. Yeah. I'm not saying it'll happen. I would just, I would like it. But I, I want to see mommy and daddy get back together again. Mm -hmm. Sorry, John, John Favreau being in there would be fun too. Who? John Favreau. Because oh, of that's foggy. Foggy. happy. Yeah. No, it's foggy. I saw well, it's foggy. As foggy, I mean. as foggy, and then also as. Oh my God! Trying to so reconcile fun. himself. If anybody like, could get him to do it, I bet it would be Ryan Reynolds. Mm -hmm. Runs into himself as. Yeah. As, as happy. happy. <laughs> oh my God! That would be fun. <laughs> All right. What's next? From Red One Real Talk, I was clutching my water bottle so tightly during Mission Impossible that it burst in the middle of the film. Oh my God. So much tension and incredible action in this. And I'm especially glad that we finally get a movie where the threat isn't just a nuclear bomb. Yeah. And again, we won't go into details about it, but it's, it's, a, it's a thoughtful Mission Impossible movie addressing real kind of questions that are being asked today. It's a timely movie, but it doesn't forget it's also a Mission Impossible movie. And... Uh, it's it's just great. All right, what's next? Uh, scroll down From a Dad Jokes, I just watched the last nine minutes of The Last of the Mohicans. Oh. So epic, especially where Magua kills Uncas and his yeah. dad sees and seeks revenge. So emotional. I know the guy who killed John Wick's dog needed to die, but Magua was a close second in that <laughs> scene, in my opinion. Such a bitter but satisfying end when it came to Magua. Evil. Gosh, I haven't seen that movie in a thousand years. Evil dude. Evil dude. And the pain in, in the dad's face. Uh, just stay alive. I. That's my least favorite of his films, though. Really? Yeah. Well, I mean, but that says something, doesn't it, about how good his films are? I mean, but I, I thought he was great in Last of the Mohicans. I, I mean, I just love everything with Daniel Day-Lewis. But yeah, that's a... Last of the Mohicans is a great movie. But that, yeah, that climax stuff with killing the sun and the cliffs and... Oof. All right, what's next? All right. From Henry Steele, hey John and crew, do you think Disney can rehabilitate Star Wars's leg legacy? What do you think it'll require to get all the fans back on board? Thanks and bring on the filthy. Same thing will take everything. <laughs> Make good movies. Make them. Make good movies. Listen, they, uh, there had never been a time in history that Star Wars fandom had been as deeply divided right, than right before Mandalorian Season 1 came out. And once that came out, it, the divisions didn't go away, but everybody was acting like they were getting along at the family dinner <laughs> at that point, right? Mandalorian being great kind of got everybody agreeing together. We, we love this star Wars thing. This is out. They all, everybody agreed. This was great. They winning cures everything. And that's, what's going to take. Listen, the star Wars legacy is never going to be touched. The only thing that's ever in question is the current state of Star Wars, right? No matter what kind of sludge or dreck they put out, if they do just put out garbage for the next five years, it doesn't matter. The original Star Wars trilogy is never going to be touched. No matter how good or bad, whatever they do now is, the original trilogy is still the original trilogy. And they're the greatest films ever made and the most imaginative thing ever in the history of Hollywood. It is what it is, and that's never going to change. Star Wars legacy is safe. It's always about the current state of Star Wars. And it can be turned around fairly quickly. 
But I'm going to tell you this. It won't be turned around on Disney+. Plus. Right? We had Andor. I think the best thing, best Star Wars thing that's ever been made since the original trilogy. Um, the, the, the rehabilitation of the current state of Star Wars will not be fixed on Disney+. Plus. It's going to take theatrical movies to do it and done well. If they can hammer that and knock that out of the park, they'll be well on their way. All right, let's take uh, one more, then we'll call it a day. Okay. From Neural. Hey, crew, just watched season two, episode seven of The Bear, and wow, everyone brought their A-game for sure, but the standouts for me were Jamie Lee Curtis and John Bernthal. Their performances were just... Oh. I believe that is the Six Fishes. Seven Fishes. Seven Fishes episode. Yes. It's one of the most stress-inducing episodes of television I've ever seen because it is so an Italian dinner. It is really an Italian. I mean, they're not, I don't believe they're Italian in the show, but it's an yeah. Italian dinner. Are they, are they supposed to be Italian? Yeah. There you go. Yeah, it's an Italian family dinner. Yeah. It completely is. It's just, is. Uh, cousin isn't. He's Polish. Mm. Um, it, it gives me such anxiety watching that episode because I do feast every year and I'm the one who cooks it for about 20 people. And it is so much like that of just get the fuck out of my kitchen. <laughs> Let me slap things with butter with my hands. Yeah. Get out. <laughs> Oh, that and, episode. And listen, in as much as I have said, and I believe that you can just engrave the Emmy now for best guest appearance Emmy to Nick Offerman for uh, The Last of Us, that's going to him. The best actress in a guest appearance role, you may just be get that warmed up for Jamie Lee Curtis because her performance in that episode if you doubted her power as an actress, even after she was holding an Academy Award, go watch this episode of The Bear. She kills it. Like, absolutely kills it. It's well, unbelievable. She walks such a fine line, too. I read so many articles and interviews after that episode because I wanted to know everything about it and how the whole casting of it, too. They wanted you as the audience to be overwhelmed and also go, where the hell is Bob Odenkirk in this? Why? Yeah. What is that Mulaney? Is what that is John he? Mulaney in there? Yeah. What is happening? Everybody's in this episode. Yeah. Oh so, my God. So that you as the viewer have that experience of, but I want to go talk to this person. I don't want to talk to you like you have at family reunions. If I don't want to be around you. I want to go talk to them. Um, but you don't know exactly what's going on with the bear's mom. You don't know if she's just a very, very stressed out alcoholic. You don't know if there's mental health issues going on. You don't know if it's a combination of everything. And with Jamie Lee Curtis, they were like, figure it out. <laughs> and she just brought so much to it she was so good at, and even that one scene with odenkirk where it's just you're nothing you're nothing you're the way odenkirk was delivering that i'm like ah this show's I've, so good i read up on it and it was the two of them kind of just coming to the director and saying hey i just want to antagonize him i really just want to do that and humiliate him and then john bernthal going i think i want to flip a table I hate him. And it was the most method they've gotten in the show ever. And they tend to stay away from that kind of stuff. But it was just letting them kind of see what happened if they just agitated each other to their fullest ability. Oh, that scene. So good. So good. And guys, speaking of so good, I got to go get that tattoo. That'll do it <laughs> for today's episode of the John Campia Show podcast. Thank you so much for being here and making this little show part of your day. Big special thank you to our channel members for submitting those questions because he gave us great fun things to talk about. And by being channel members, you support our show. And we thank you guys so much for that support. Hey, if there are those of you who kind of watch a video version of this on YouTube, because this is recorded as an audio podcast, but we do record it and put it up on YouTube as well. The best way to consume the show is in podcast format. Make sure you go and find our podcast, the John Capish Show podcast on your favorite podcasting app of choice, whether that's Apple Podcasts, Spotify, any of the other third-party podcast apps that you like to use. Go and subscribe to us so that when you're on the road or at the gym or at work, you want to take in the show, but you can't have a YouTube video open, check it out the way it was meant to be consumed as a podcast. Go and find us there. So I want to thank everybody in the room with me, Ray Aura, hey, who apparently wants me to go to prison. <laughs> Uh, Jonathan Boyko. See ya. Chris Carr. Bye, guys. My name's John. We might, next time we see you, you may be on strike. Uh, yeah. We'll find out. Doing a lot more audiobooks these days. <laughs> <laughs> my name's John Campia. And until next time, my friends, bye-bye. Keep dreaming. Keep dreaming. <laughs>